You know, uh, every week we get together, we uh, study the Word of God, and uh, we're looking at the book of Galatians, and sometimes it tends to get a bit technical, but I want to say this. You know, every single Sunday when we get together, we're, re- we're refining and tuning our understanding of the Word of God. And I'll tell you why that is important. The efficacy of your faith, the effectiveness of your faith is based on how you believe. And how you believe affects the results of your faith. And how you believe is shaped by your understanding of the Word of God. Right believing brings right results. False believing brings no results. There are people that believe all their lives about certain things in the Bible, but they just can't seem to see that it's happening. And they don't understand why their belief is not working. I want to encourage you not to walk in the ways of the religion, uh, but that you come every Sunday so that you can fine-tune, if you may, uh, or, or just improve your understanding of the Word of God so that you can have a better believing system to bring better results for your lives. While we're on earth, before we get to heaven, there's so many struggles and mountains and valleys and so many needs and so many desires and wants. And, and if we don't have the right believing, we ended up becoming very cynical because after a while, you've realized that whatever that you're believing in is not working. And so my job as a pastor is hopefully be able to uh, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to use me to explain to you the Word of God, including the book of Galatians. So what we're going to study and what we've been studying is not so that we can have more information, but so that our believing systems can be fine-tuned and improved. So improve the efficacy or the effectiveness of your faith. How many of you, know one, how many of you want your faith to be effective? So let's, uh, let's say a word of prayer and ask the Lord to, to, uh, to teach us this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray for the Holy Spirit to come and teach us. Father, we want our faith to be effective. We want our, uh, the efficacy of our faith to improve. Day by day, week by week, month by month. Open our ears, open our eyes, so that we can have better understanding, so that we can fine-tune our faith every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember, the purpose of the book of Galatians is for Paul to refute the uh, doctrines that is based on legalism, but specifically based on Judaism, meaning that if you want to get saved, you need to observe the law. And if you want to observe the law, you'll learn later on in Galatians, is that you have to observe all 613 of them. Because if you observe the law, uh, 612 of them, you're doing fine with 612 of them, and you just miss one, like you exaggerate a little bit, meaning you lie a little bit, then you have committed, as far as the law is concerned, all 613. Your lying a little bit becomes as bad as murdering somebody and committing adultery. And so that's legalism, that's doctrines of Judaism uh, uh, that it was perpetuated in the, in the days of Paul. You know, I want to say this. Many people, many Christians love rules. Love, they love laws. You know why? You might sit and say, no, no, not me. I, I don't like laws. We actually like rules and law because it's easier, it's familiar, it's something that we can control. If you do A, you get B. If you do A plus B, you get C. Right? So something that we can control, something that we can actually have some kind of assurance that it will work. Whereas true faith in Christ is giving up all your control, surrender everything. It is by grace through faith. 
So you need grace. You need to lean on God. You need to lean on him as hard as possible from the first day to the day that you breathe the last breath. And even after that, when you get to heaven, you keep leaning on him. That's faith. Being independent means you don't need to lean on God as much. You don't need to be at his mercy as much. You just need to do the rules and you'll be right okay. And so most people would prefer law or they prefer because of familiarity and also because it's controllable. But you and I are not called to a faith that we can control. Are you here this morning? A lot of times we feel that we can control faith, we can control things. Our faith is never about controlling. Our faith is about what? Surrendering. So the minute you think, oh, I think I got it, that's the minute that you don't got it. A minute that you say, man, I, I, think I, I think I figure it out. I think I figure out how God works is a minute that you don't get it. All our lives, every single day, in every aspect of our lives, if you want to believe in Jesus, if you want to walk in this thing called the Christian faith, it's a faith that keeps leaning hard on God every day. And that's why that song is so powerful. In the, the hymns that we used to sing, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Not every crisis I need thee. Not every month I need thee. Not every Christmas I need thee. Not every Easter I need thee. But every hour I need thee. And sometimes when I sing that song, I say, God, I need you, not just every hour, but every second of my existence. Do you know how vulnerable we are as human beings? We're very vulnerable. We're vulnerable to all kinds of attacks, all kinds of harms, all kinds of mishappening. You know, the world is very vulnerable. We need Jesus every second of the day. That's what our faith is. It's complete surrender and leaning on God. Whereas the world, and somehow he had sipped into the church, is that, no, you can be dependent. You don't need God all the time. You maybe need them the next crisis. You need them the next Christmas. You need them, you know, but no, it's you need them all the time. Not, you're not leaning on the formulas. You're not leaning on the rules. You're not leaning on something that you can control. Amen? So that's why many people kind of find it very easy to fall into this era of following the laws. But anyways, we're going to start with chapter 2, but we, re we read verse 1 and verse 2. And let me give you a commentary about chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 10 we're going to look at. What Paul is trying to show us here is that what he's preaching is what he is saying, what he spoke about, is something that is so true that it was endorsed by all the recognized church leaders, all the apostles of Jesus Christ at the time when Paul was preaching the gospel. You see later on is that the gospel that Paul was preaching was so different from all the other, what the other apostles were preaching. Not that they are two different gospels. It's just the presentation was so different. The understanding, the theology was so different that it, it, it just is a shock everybody. So he needs to show to the church, to the readers, you and I, and back in the days so that what he was saying, the revelation that he had was legitimate, was valid. You know, a lot of times, you know, some, some people probably done this exercise. If you take all the epistles of, uh, in the Bible, you take all the epistles, the, the epistle of Paul, epistle of Peter, John, whatever, you take them out of the Bible, and you don't practice any of the epistle, the Christian faith will look very different. Very different. And that's why Paul needs to establish his authority that was given by God and recognized by the apostle of his days. So watch this, right? Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. That'd be verse 1, chapter 2. Then I went up by revelation uh, and communicated them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But privately to those who were of reputation, lest that by any means I might run and had run uh, in vain. So we explained that two weeks ago. 
And uh, so we're going to go on with verse 3. Yet not even Titus was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to observe this very critical part of the law called circumcision. Here, Titus, half Greek, half Jews. So the mom was Jewish, the, the, uh, the dad was Greek. So that made him half Greek and half Jews. And he was not circumcised. He was born and raised in a Greek environment and Greek culture. And so, you know, here is a test case that Paul is trying to demonstrate. He said, this Greek fellow who is half Greek and half Jewish, even him was, was, uh, was following what I'm preaching. So the leaders of the church at the time had probably encouraged Paul to say, you know, you brought this Greek fellow to Jerusalem. You should circumcise him just to make peace with the people around. Don't, 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 don't stir, stir up any, don't ruffle any fetters, you know. And so for the sake of peace, Paul was probably encouraged by the leaders at the time to say, hey, listen, would you just circumcise him for goodness sake? We want to have peace among the brethren. But Paul says he was not going to allow them to compel. He used the word compel. He said, well, I'll let people to compel me to make peace, even though it's against my conscience, right? So Paul refused to yield to, 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 to have peace. He, he refused to yield and accept the bondage of the law over the freedom of the gospel so that he can have peace. And I want you to pay very close attention to this for the next few minutes. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to repeat myself a few times. But Paul did not change his behavior, his conviction, his message based on the different audience that he was facing and the different culture that he found himself in. I'm going to get back to this point a couple of times. And he later on, you will see that the other apostles, they commit that error, is that, you know, they, though they say one thing, when they hang out with different people, they behave differently. We'll get to that. Verse 4. So this occur, this occur because the false brother, I'm going to pause here a little bit. False brother here means those people who push for legalism. So they're Christians. They call themselves Christian. They accept Jesus as their personal savior. But they were pushing this uh, Judaism. We call them Judaizer. They're pushing this law. And because of that, call, Paul called them false brethren. Uh, I want to say things that I might offend you a little bit. I pray that you forgive me if I do offend you. Not every Christian that call themselves a Christian are really Christian. Last week, Pastor Paul, I'm Pastor Paul. <laughs> last week, Pastor Young. Hey, didn't he do a good job last week? Yeah. Come on, let's, let's get, where is he? Is he, you know? So he, um, he was talking about character of believers, making our faith attractive. You know, and one of the things that make your faith attractive is your character. And there's a lot of Christians calling themselves Christians, but they have no character. So not every Christian say, I'm a Christian, is Christian. Not everybody call you brother or sister. They are truly your brother and sister. And here Paul is just saying, you know, hey, listen, all those people who, who Judaizer, impressing Judaism, who insist that all the Gentiles need to follow the law, they are a true brother. Now watch this. Secretly, this false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us in bondage. You know, I always say this, everything that is done in stealth is always questionable. The people that want to say, Psst, hey, guess what I know? Be careful whether it's about the gospel or whether it's gossiping about somebody else's character. Do you know what I know? Everything that is done in stealth, you ought to be careful, right? Anyways, verse 5, let's move on. To whom we did not you, 
submission even for one hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, this is so important for my life, and I hope it's for your life. I need you to listen to this very carefully. Not just personally, but for, for future generations and others. Every time when we take a stand in our faith, as individual, as parents, as grandparents, as a Christians, as a church, every time we take a stand and we're not yielding to heresy in spite of so many pressure to compromise these days, every time we take a stand, we're not affecting our own lives only. What we're doing is that we're affecting the lives of the people in future generations that are coming. Paul said he wouldn't even give them an hour of hearing. He wouldn't even indulge in compromising his faith so that he can make peace, so that he can, he can indulge. He, he would, for the sake of the people that will be coming, for the sake of the people that we hear in the gospel in future years, in future times, in future generations, do not give room to compromise. Otherwise, the future generations of God's church, God's truth will be affected. You know, these days, culturally, you and I have been, comp- have been pressured to say, oh, come on, you know, we're living in the modern days. Come on, man. And give a little, compromise a little. Come on, why are you so why are you why are you so stubborn? Why are you so why are you so religious? My goodness, why are you like why are you so 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 stiff neck? Why are you why are you so non compromise? Come on, man, just just be normal, you know. Don't be those extremists, you know. They say, and all those words that they use is to pressure believers to compromise. You know, that was this young. Not young anymore. So there was this fellow um, who was a very, very famous preacher. And I don't want to mention his name because, you know, in public I don't do that. Just very famous preacher. When I was a, a teenager, I would listen to him a lot. I'd let, always see, what, man, he was such an amazing communicator. He, he changed my life, you know, and uh, every time he comes to Toronto, I know he'll go to the people's church, you know, and I'll just go listen to him. Just very effective communicator, one of the most prominent evangelical leaders in North America, I think, in the world. People know about him all over the world. And just recently, when I say recently, I mean about 10 years ago, maybe even longer, he came out to the public he said that I no longer believe that homosexual is wrong because many of our friends who are homosexual are just normal people. They're just loving people. They're very kind. I was devastated when I heard that. Who says homosexuals are nasty? Nobody ever said that. If people said that, they're crazy. We're not talking about personality and character. Nobody's knocking anybody's character. The Bible is not knocking people's character when it talks about sin. Sin is sin. Whether it's homo or hetero, sin is sin. And when we come to the place where we say, well, you know, those people who, who sin, you know, who, who are not living up to the biblical standard, they're a nice guy. As if nice guy makes it holy. As if niceness make it right. There's a lot of nice guys I know that are going not to heaven, going straight to hell. They're very nice. They're extremely nice. But Jesus said, I'm the only way, the truth and life. No man shall come to the Father except through me. Can we, if we believe what Jesus said, that's, that's what we have to believe. You know, this week, um, um, there was this atro- atrocity that happened in Ottawa. Some of you heard the story about this, this Buddhist monk, you know, he sponsors his family from whatever country, and then they, he was such a nice person. He, he rented the house from this, this, this person that, that's on the street, and this person killed the entire family. Six of them or something like that, right? I don't know if you heard the news. But this guy, he was injured, and in the hospital, he was so concerned for this fellow that killed his family. He's, he's, he's concerned for him. He's a nice guy. He's nicer than most Christians. But nice city, is there such a word, nice city? You know, ESL. Nice city 
cannot save you. If niceness can save you, then you don't need Jesus. Why do we even need Jesus? If being nice is sufficient. And so I was really disappointed because this pastor, this preacher, under a tremendous pressure politically, and he had to succumb. He had to say, well, I guess it's okay because they're nice people. Paul the Apostle said that we stood our ground not only for ourselves but for you guys because if I had not stood the ground, what you're going to hear is a compromised gospel that will not help you. Compromised gospel is compromised theology. Compromised theology means your understanding of God's word and faith, therefore, is not effective. Now, efficacy of your faith is not there. You can believe all you want. It's just a religious thing to ease your conscience. It does nothing for you. But what you want is your faith to actually work. That's what we're pursuing is the faith. That works. So if you want your faith to work, you can't compromise. You might feel good about it when you're compromising, but it doesn't bring results. If it doesn't bring results, why bother? It's like, you know, um, uh, you know, I, um, I always admire my, my, my daughter and my wife, when they cook, they follow the recipes to the letter. And they use measuring cups, those measuring thingy, and then they have those, um, the thing that weight, uh, the scale, <laughs> the scale. And you know, when they cook, it's like the whole kitchen is like a storm just take place because they bring all these tools and gadget. And then they just measure it to the very last millimeters, you know, just, and then it comes up exactly what they expected. Me, on the other hand, is like, ah, just, just, just eyeball it, you know. (laughs) And it comes out, nothing. Nobody wants to eat my food. It's like, you can all eat your own food, you know. We'll go out tonight, you know. Oh, that's good. That makes sure that I don't cook for the rest of my life, which is fantastic. But anyways, it's the same thing is that if you think you can just eyeball the Word of God and you don't follow it, then it won't work. It come up with something different. Many of us have our faith come up with something different. We go, hey, it's not what I want, but it's what you put in. It's what is going to come out. But if you're very diligent to the last millimeters, Shandai, oh, it's going to come up perfect. That's why you and I need to fine tune our faith. Don't kid yourself. This thing is real. It's not just a wish and a hope. Hopefully something work in the future. Then you're wasting your time. If you want it to work, you follow the word. It rhymes, doesn't it, eh? If you want it to work, you follow the word. Believers are not to live our own life for our own self-interest. We are not being considerate only for the people around us now. Even if you have no children, you ought to be considerate for the future generations. Can you imagine... If the church, every successive generation compromised a little bit, eventually there'll be no more truth. Can you imagine starting from Paul, the compromise 5%. The next generation compromised another 5%. The next generation compromised another 5%. By the time it gets to us, it'll look nothing like what the original message is. But aren't you grateful and thankful that each generation, there are people that stood their faith, kept their faith, kept the word of God, and did not want to compromise. You know, when I was a child, I don't know how true it is. I think I heard it from Debbie. 
And uh, she, you know, as a kid, you believe everything, right? So she was much older, no, not much older, but you know, she's older than me, you know. Oh, you can't say anything. Anyway, so, so, so we're sitting around and we're talking about Kung Fu. I don't know if you remember. I think she said that, maybe her or somebody. And she said, you know why we can't do the Kung Fu they used to do back in the days? How many of you watched the movie called Crouching Tiger? What is it? What's the movie called? Crouching Tiger. Hidden Dragon? Hidden Dragon, Crouching Tiger. You, you know, some of you sitting there younger, what was that? That was, how, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago it came out. Like it was an old movie. If you watch that, people can actually fly. Woo. It's amazing. And you always wonder, would they, would they really able to fly? And so here comes the theory that Debbie had, right? It's like the reason we can't do that today, you know, you know, swords flying all over, you know, those kung fu movies. And maids, I love those, those, uh, those movies, those, those movies that have, I think, half fairy tale and half truth. People flying all over, you know, they can meditate to, they leave the body, you know, this whole thing. And so, so that be saying, you know, each of the generation, the master would keep 5% to themselves, lest the student rebel, then he has this last trick that he can overcome. So they will hold back a little bit. Every generation, they hold back a little bit. By the time it gets to us, all they do is hoo-ha, hoo-ha, nothing, right? Just, they do nothing. They can't even fight a fly, right? So, so, so I don't know how true it is, but, but it, it, sounds, it sounds about right, right? So, so if we compromise a little bit in every generation, what's going to happen is that by the time it reaches the, le- the later generation, they're not going to have the truth. So for the sake of the people in the future. If our God should tarry, we should never, never, never compromise the Word of God, even if a lot of pressure is on us to be accepted by the world. Are you here this morning? Amen. All right, let's move on. Verse 6. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows uh, personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. I pray that that will be your testimony. Especially in these days, our culture, it's all about being influenced by the influencers. You heard that before, right? Influencers always influence us. You know, the days of our social media, uh, you know, advertisers always looking for people with a lot of followers by the millions. And so they will pay them oodles of money. We used to have a brother. He moved to California, and uh, he used to come to this church, and he he represents that he's an agent of those uh, influencers. Um, he represent the top 10% or something like that for, uh, for the top social influencer in the world. Some of them have hundreds of millions of followers. You know, in one of our men's fellowship, we, we had him to speak in uh, one of our men's fellowship, and he didn't really get into the detail, but, you know, that's basically what he, his, his job was. It's just, it's to manage this influencer, the reasons because this influencer, these people with millions of followers have such influence on society that's, that the, the, the manufacturers or different company would hire them to promote their products, knowing that most of us are easily influenced by influencers. And within the church culture, we are easily influenced by church influencers, celebrity pastors. And we just just listen to them without even double-checking the Word of God. Being like a Berean believer in the book of Acts, always check the Word of God. So whoever says this, we just go, yeah, I think it's right. We go, Gaga, I'm believing in them. Sometimes, you know, you, you and I need to be very cautious about being easily influenced. And Paul here says, listen, man, those people who are supposed to be something, they add nothing to me. 
I pray that that's your testimony. Those who are, seem to be something added nothing to me because all that I got is by the grace of God through the Word of God. Very simple. And I pray that this is our pursuit, you know. And he said that God shows personal favoritism to no one. I always thought, man, you know, those people who are blessed, they must be special. They must be something else. Wow. But here Paul says, don't worry. You are not any less special than Paul the Apostle. Just let that square in your mind what that means. You are no less special. Don't care about your education. Don't care about your experience. You are no less special in the eyes of God than Paul the Apostle and all the apostles back in the days. As far as we're con God is concerned, we all saved by grace, true faith. That's where the idea of democracy comes from. No favoritism, no political connection, nothing special. And you and I in that kingdom, we often succumb to compromise because some famous people say so, or someone with some titles suggests so, and sometimes some movies with famous movies people suggest so. I was watching this movie yesterday called The Rapture. This is a new one. This came out 2022. It's called The Rapture. Why do I want to watch that? I don't know. It's fascinating. And so I was sitting there watching The Rapture. In that movie, The Rapture had already taken place. And that's what makes it very exciting because that's where all the trouble comes, right? And so Rapture had taken place, you know. And uh, so the church got left behind. And not the church got left behind. The people got left behind. And even one of the pastors got left behind. And so there goes the story. And in that conversation they had among the pastor himself and then the people in the congregation, you know, they're quoting 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about those of us who are alive, we should be caught up in the air, we'll meet the Lord, and we shall be together with him forever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so when I was younger, I would go, wow, that's the word of God. But in the course of the dialogue, the conversation, because now I have read the Word of God so often, I, I'm so familiar, I could pick and go, that's not the Word of God. That's your imagination. That's never in the Word of God. That's what we believe all this time, but it was never written as always assume. But I believe many young believers would have taken that movie as the Word of God. How can you not? You don't know anything else. For many of the believers. In order for you and I not to be compromising, we need to know the Word of God. Otherwise, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know what you're compromising and what you're not compromising. Is it not true? So I'm very concerned about many believers worshiping and trusting humans, movies, and, and other men of God. We must trust the Word of God. You know, many of us listen to prophecies. You know, you listen to prophecy, right? Somebody prophesied to you, thus says the Lord, you know, Shandai, you know, this, that, and the other thing. We listen to prophecy. I listen to prophecy too. When I was younger, I would just believe every word and cling unto every word that they have. I do want to encourage you to honor and respect prophets because believing God, you shall be saved. Believing his prophets, you shall prosper. That's what the word of God says. But not every prophet that comes to you and tells you that they're prophet are truly prophets. In fact, in Revelation, he tells the church that we ought to test the prophets. You know, these days, there's so many people are prophesying so many things. Believers, I want to encourage you to be careful. Do what the Bible says. Test the prophets. How do you test the prophets? See if it comes to pass. There are prophets that have prophesied things that hadn't come to pass. In fact, had apologized for it. And then they say, well, I'm just human. Then when do I believe you? Because if you say oh, you're just human the last time, what makes you so sure you're not human this time? 
I often say this, you know, there's some incredible celebrity prophets out there. Everybody just going, wow, have you heard this person say this? Heard you had that person say that? I remember one prophetess, a female, very famous, still very famous, still people going gaga with her in among the charismatic. I don't know why, but she had prophesied quite a number of things that are false. Never happened. Didn't happen. She even prophesied one of the church leaders in the Philippines was going to be the next president of the Philippines. Never happened. She did it twice. The first time, she said, well, you know. And then the second time, another election, she did it again, and this guy got less votes. And yet people say, well, you know, have, she's, and then, you know, we were at a, a World Pentecostal Conference. I told my wife all about this prophetess. I said, I'm not going to believe her because she's done come through for twice. Major event. People in North America didn't know that. She did it in Singapore. I go, I, I don't I think I won't believe her. So, so she, my wife already know my opinion about this woman. So in Amsterdam, World Pentecostal Conference, all the world leaders, and lo and behold, they gave her a big award. I almost felt like standing up and walking out of that place. Like, I can't believe my eyes. Believers, I want to encourage you. Don't despise prophets. Honor them. But test them, would you? Test them. Deuteronomy teaches, teaches us how we ought to test the prophet. Very simple. Whatever they say, if it doesn't come to pass, they're not a prophet. Are you here? If they come to pass, yes, they're prophets. Is it a time for learning or whatever? I believe so. But if somebody claimed to be a national celebrity, you know, that says the Lord all the time, I'd be very careful. Anyways, that's the prophet. Verse 7, but on the contrary, when they, which means the church leaders, saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, that would be the Jews, also work effectively in me toward the Gentiles. Does it sound like there are two Gospels? One are for the Jews and one the rest of us. Doesn't it sound like it? He's like, okay, let me read it again. If it doesn't sound like it, I'm not trying to convince you, but read it again. But on the contrary, when the church leaders, when they saw that the Gospel for the uncircumcised, there is a gospel for the uncircumcised. Watch this. Had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised. There's another gospel called the gospel of circumcised. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. So, is it two gospel? Now, this is what I believe. There's only one gospel. We are saved by grace through faith. Turn to your neighbor and say one gospel. Just one. Just one. Now, what is Paul talking about? So, if you were to preach to the Jews at the time, and Jesus did the same thing, right? And if you preach to the Jews at the same time, you understand that the Jewish culture, if you're Jewish, you're going to go tell a Jew saying, hey, listen, man, don't follow the law, don't follow Moses, because whatever. It's like somebody come to me, being Chinese. Um, actually, that's not a good example. If somebody come to, come to me, being Chinese, and say, you know, don't, uh, don't eat barbecue pork. Good luck, right? <laughs> or somebody go to John Collins and say, thou shalt not eat smoked meat. Would it work? It won't work. So what I'm telling you is this. The message must never be compromised. But to be effective in presenting the message, the method can be different. The message cannot be compromised. There's only one gospel. 
Peter was more effective being that he was called to be an apostle among the Jews to preach to the Jews the gospel effectively the way the Jewish people will receive it. But later on you'll see that they still, the Jewish people still need Jesus and only by Jesus they are saved. On the other hand, Paul the Apostle is being called to preach to the Gentiles. You got to remember, he's a very educated man, both in Greek literature and also in Jewish literature. So he was very effective in communicating the gospel to those who are what we call the Hellenized Jews or, or the Greek themselves. Hellenized Jews be Jews that's being influenced by the Greek culture. So he was very effective in communicating the gospel to them. This is what I want to say. Don't be offended when you see the gospel is presented differently. Don't be offended when you see that, you know, um, uh, you know the church looks different. The church changed uh, in terms of its styles or whatever. Don't be offended. Listen to the message Cut in through into the message. Is he talking about the truth? Do they compromise? Don't worry about the outward presentation, however it looks like. Now, it may not be your cup of tea. That's understandably so. This is a free country. Go to the place where is your cup of tea. But the most important thing is whether it's your cup of tea or not, whether it soothes your culture or not, is that they cannot be different gospel. They may call themselves the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, but the gospel cannot, cannot, cannot change. The method of presenting can be changed. The presentation can be changed. The style can be changed. You know, I'll tell you the truth. I'm 56 years old. Some of you don't think it's old, but never mind, right? So I'm 56 years old. You know what really keep me, get me going in terms of feeling the presence of God? It's not what get a lot of young people going. They need the light, the smoke, the laser, and they need elevation worship song, or they need Maverick City. They need, I don't know, what's out there? Bethel, they need, I don't know, one of those big worship team out there. They're like, oh, hill song, you know, oh, I can feel God. When I hear those songs, I feel nothing. I was like, where is it? Nothing. I don't feel anything. Because that's not my culture. My culture is hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's there right now. It's there. What, what is it? Is it God is not there? God is there? I'm telling you, we, we, we all need to understand very clearly is that the message must be the same. We can always let go a little bit of the formality, the format, the presentation. Just let it go. I used to be very uptight. I tell the worship team, you know, you ought to sing this song. But I don't say anything anymore. I just come in at the end and sing my song, right? Praise God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to each his own, right? And they're all good. They're all very anointed. I love the worship team we have. They're so anointed. They just, they just sing. It was good. But make no mistakes, right? Okay. I don't want to beat this to death. Let's, let's move on. Verse, uh, verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, recognized leaders, of course, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace... Did I read this already? Yes. Uh, Seem to perceive the grace that had been given to me. That would be the grace that given to me to preach to the uncircumcised, right? They gave me and Barnabas the right hand fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desire only that we should remember the poor and that everything which I also was eager to, to hear. Paul again demonstrates that what he preaches and teaches, the things that he's talking about in Galatians, not need to follow the laws because you're Gentiles. The gospel of grace and faith, the gospel outside rules and laws of Judaism 
It's very valid. It was endorsed by the church leaders back then, endorsed by Jesus' closest apostles, endorsed by the church council itself. So it was legitimate. Now, let's go to 11, which is actually a bit of a twist. And uh, then I'm going to close. Now, Peter, when Peter, that will be the recognized leaders, left Jerusalem, went to Antioch. That was the center of the Christian movement among Gentiles and Jews. It was like an epic center of the amazing Christianity movement at the time. He said, Peter came to Antioch, and I confronted or withstood him. That is, I confronted him to his face. Because he was to be blamed. So, let me pause here. So, if chapter 2, verse 1 to 10 is about, Paul is trying to tell people that, hey, what I'm preaching about the gospel of grace is legitimate. It's powerful for us, the uncircumcised. Furthermore, from verse 11 to 17, Paul is actually also saying that the revelation of grace also applies to this recognized apostle. Not only to those non-Jews, but this gospel of grace, whether, whether it, it, the formality, whatever, is still the same gospel. So if anybody were to come to you and say, well, you know, I'm Jewish, I have a different gospel, it's a lie. Verse 12, this is what he was talking about. He said, for a certain man came from James, that would be in Jerusalem, James was the leader of the church council, right? He would eat before the certain man came from Jerusalem, before his, the people from the church in Jerusalem, the council came, Peter would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he knew that the Jewish people would be offended that Peter, you know, you're Jew, you cannot hang out with the non-Jews. If you're Jewish, you're not supposed to have any in their tradition and culture. And that's why when he goes to Cornelius' house, he made an exception after he had a vision. He usually cannot go into the house. In fact, after he came and visit, he visited Cornelius, he was being accused by the church council and many believers of him hanging out in the home of an unbeliever, a, 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 a non-Jew. So, Peter was afraid of the same people. So he withdrew himself and separated himself fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with hypocrisy. In other words, when they were Jews people, they just acted like any other Jews, gospel or no gospel. And verse 14, he said, but when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, before all of them, if you, being a Jew, live in a matter of Gentiles, that is, needing Jesus for your salvation and not as Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law. Everybody say this with me. Man are not justified by the works of the law. Let's say it again. Men are not justified by the works of the law. Now confess it yourself. I am not justified by the works of the law. Do you believe that? Okay. We are not just, but, by what? By faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we justify, by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified, that we, even as Jews need to believe in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found to be sinners, is Christ therefore minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I built again those things which I destroyed, that would be the law, I make myself a transgressor. For through the law, 
For I, uh, that I, I through the law, die to the law, that I might live to God. Let me close with this idea. I'm going to talk more about the law and, then, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the gospel and faith later on uh, next week. Be very aware of your behavior with different groups of people. Make sure that your behavior is consistent. Turn to your neighbor and say consistent. Many of our behaviors are not consistent. We behave one way with one group and we behave another way with another group. You know, I was talking to my children about being proud of your faith. You know, one of my child said to me, yesterday we had this big, big conversation. As a, as, a, as a father of believer, not a pastor, a, a believer father. Hello, believer father, listen. I always encourage my children to always share their faith. Share the gospel. Don't be weird about it, because weird is still weird, right? So don't be weird about it, but be proud. You know, Jesus, in three of the four gospels, says, if you do not recognize me before men, I will not recognize you or acknowledge you before the angels and before the Father. In one of the gospels, it seems to imply that when we get to heaven, after the tribulation, you know, all the judgment, then we get to heaven and Jesus go, well, you didn't recognize me when you're on earth, bye-bye. But that's only one gospel that actually implied that. The rest of the other two gospels didn't imply that. What I'm trying to tell you is that it's not just after everything is done, you go to heaven. It's right now. The Bible says, if you do not acknowledge, Jesus said, if you do not acknowledge me before man, I will not acknowledge you, present tense, before the Father. Do you and I know, do you know that Jesus is interceding for you? Do you know that? He's praying for you. Jesus, I'm praying, Lord, I pray for Paul Ku. He just blew up the other day. He exaggerated some truth. Forgive him, because pastor team to do that. Just, Lord, forgive, forgive him. Sales people do that too. Thank God I'm not in sales anymore. Hallelujah. You know, saying, you know, Lord, forgive him for he exaggerated the truth. Or he told somebody trying to be nice, told some lies about something because he doesn't want to offend that person. You know, if you have nothing good to say, don't say it. Why do you have to say anything? But because, you know, we like to talk, we say it, and we say lies. We exaggerate truth, we, we cover the truth, we sugarcoat the truth, but anyways. So Jesus is interceding for me every day. Yes? We agree that, right? But if he's not acknowledging you, how is he going to intercede for you? It's like, I don't know this person. How is he going to say, oh, I pray for that? He can't even acknowledge you. How is he going to pray for you? How is he going to intercede for you? So I'm telling my children, I say, hey, listen, you need to be proud of your faith. Bring them to church. If anybody's hitting on you or you hit, just bring them to church. Bring them to church. And um, tell them about your faith. You know, one of my child, they both go to university. They both involve in Christian fellowship. So one of the Christian fellowships, they, they are practicing Lent. You know what that is? It's a Catholic idea that has been adopted by evangelical churches everywhere. But it's not in the Bible. Whatever, it's good. You know, it's not biblical. That's why we don't talk about it, right? I only talk about biblical stuff, things that is in the Word of God, not in church tradition. Are you here this morning? So not the, I'm not knocking Lent. You want to do Lent, knock yourself out, suffer, be reproached for Christ. The Bible never told you to. 
30 days before the resurrection, the crucifixion, you'll go suffer yourself. The Bible, it's a, it's a Catholic concept, which is cool. If you want to do it, just knock yourself out. It's not in the Bible. Are you here this morning? So this Christian fellowship full of Christian, many evangelical now pick up this thing called Lent. And so they do different things on Lent. I, I was at the conference just the other week. This pastor, you know, he said, I'm committed to Lent. I'm committed to do this during Lent. He said, I'm going to finish the Bible front to back in 30 days. He said, that's about a few hours of reading the Bible every single day. Wow, good luck. Praise God. Good for you. And then some people say, I will not watch TV. Well, that's easy these days. Most people don't watch TV anyways. Try not to do social media. That's a tough one, right? <laughs> no Instagram, no Facebook, no TikTok, no X, no YouTube. Try to do that without, with, with 30 days. How many of you think you can do it? Wow, just two hands. Well, it's tough, right? Well, anyway, so people say, Lent, and therefore, I'm not going to, I'm going to fast on social media. I'm going to fast on food. Well, that's great. So this Bible, this, this Christian fellowship, their Lent is to suffer reproach for Christ. Meaning to, in, in, in my child's mind, what, sh, what this child is thinking is that I'm going to be humiliated and rejected for Christ. I want to be humiliated and rejected for Christ during Lent. What that means is I'm going to go and tell strangers about Jesus and expect it to be rejected. That's my Lent for Christ. And I say, why don't you invite your friend to church? No, no. How do you, how do you, so you want to be Reproach for Christ in one setting, but in another setting, I don't know. I, I don't want. You see what I mean? So Peter is being admonished for his inconsistency in his behavior, and that his behavior is different in one from one group to another. I want to encourage you: be real, be authentic. Meaning, be the same wherever you go, whenever, wherever you are. Are you here this morning? Yes. Come on. You, 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 you call, you know, we always, we in our generation, in this generation, worship team, can you come out? I'm done now. In this generation, authenticity is absolutely prime, 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 most important. Authenticity. They demand that preachers like me are authentic, meaning that I can be preaching Jesus. I need to have Jesus at home too. I've been preaching the Word of God. I need to study the Word of God at home. I, I'm talking about loving people, generous, whatever. I need to practice that in my life. I, you, you don't like a preacher that preach about Jesus on, on Sunday and then live like the world from Monday to Saturday, right? Yes? Do you want a preacher that lived two lives? That would be horrible. There would be no life. And if you catch me one day sitting in a bar getting drunk, then you will stop coming to church, right? If you one day saw me, you know, you know just have, you know, drive on 4 1 and you saw a couple of guys, oh, that looked like Pastor Paul. He's having a baseball bat beating up another guy because of road rage. Would you still come to this church? No, absolutely not, because you consider me not authentic. I want to encourage all of us. You don't need to be weird. Please don't be weird. The gospel is not weird. Are you here this morning? Amen. The gospel is good. The gospel is cool. Come on. And so you and I need to understand that and live our life out. Live Jesus out. Let Christ be manifest. Be manifested in and through you. Would you please stand to your feet?